Um, and it will be available on our ULVLC uh, LibGuide, uh, where all of the other magic is stored from the past ULVLC sessions. Um, but if you, again, if you have any questions, tech issues, anything like that, please feel free to put that in the chat. I will be monitoring chat while our presenters are um, sharing with us today. And with that, I will turn it over to our presenters. Hey everybody, I'm going to get us going before kind of opening things up a little bit. Um, so for those who don't know, this is uh, some work that's coming out of the Community Connections group that was started back in August, along with a number of other, um, I can't I can't remember what we actually ended up call them, communities, um, learning groups within the university libraries. So um, this is a group that Tim and Kathleen specifically from are the AAG contacts um, for, but um, again, we started our work back in August. We had lots of conversations about what does community mean? What does community engagement mean? What do we think when we think of when we think of community focused projects? Community focused is kind of the language we decided we, we landed on in many ways. Um, this semester, so the semester that we are wrapping up right now, we focused primarily on external communities. So we focused primarily on projects, resources, programs, things like that, that benefit and are primarily aimed at non-UNCG communities. So folks away from our campus who may not have any affiliation with UNCG. They may, but they may not. Next semester, we're going to kind of switch that focus and have a little bit more focus on UNCG communities. So, you know, students, faculty, staff, alumni, people who are actively um, affiliated with the university. So most of you probably remember you got a survey uh, back in October, I believe it was, asking for current and fairly recent projects that you've been working on that have that kind of external community focus, a report on that. Um, I don't think it's been produced yet, but it's forthcoming. Um, this is the first of a series of three panel discussions that we're gonna have. And um, so this is number one. Number two is on December 15th at 1 p.m. It's focused on growing community connections. Um, and then on Thursday, January 7th at 1 p.m., we're gonna focus on resources for, commu for building community connections. And all of these are gonna be done in partnership with ULVLC. So um, the lovely Jenny Dale will be providing you with more information on how to, um, how to sign up for those. So um, that's kind of the grand overview of what we're doing here, why we're doing it. Um, as Jenny said, today we have, um, three panelists, I'm one of them, um, Stacy Krim is another one and Nakia Hoskins is another. Richard uh, Cox has volunteered to moderate uh, the panel discussions for us. And primarily what we're gonna do is Richard's gonna throw out questions, um, a series of questions that each of us in turn will answer. And the three of us, I, how about this? We didn't discuss this, but we can go alphabetically. So Nakia, then Stacy, then me to respond to Richard's questions. Um, and we'll talk about not just a specific project that we've worked on, and we may bring in examples from specific projects, but we're gonna talk kind of in a broader overview, um, as well as giving specific examples in reference to the questions that Richard asks. But the most important part for, for the awesome 25 folks who are here, which, yeah, Jenny, this is a, this is a big group. Um, the, the largest uh, part of time, we're gonna save at least 20 minutes, if not more than that. Um, for audience Q&A. So we want to hear from folks about um, questions you may have, um, additional responses you may have, issues you may have come up with in doing this type of work. And honestly, anything that this Community Connections group can do to, um, you know, we don't necessarily have the ability to provide resources because most of us aren't department heads or in AG, but um, you know, what can we do to help advocate and, and support things that are, that are happening through this group? But um, 
yeah, that's kind of the overview. So I guess now I'm going to throw it over to Richard, our uh, lovely moderator, and um, we'll get started. Okay, so I think everyone can hear me just fine. Um, first question I will be posing is, can each of you talk about a community-based project that you've started with a local community or a community group for libraries, programs, events, and projects? All right, sure, I am up first. So um, I'll be very specific. Um, first, I'll talk about maybe some of the initiatives, the projects that I was kind of um, given when I was um, started working here for the libraries, it was some things that were already in talk and conversation. And so I kind of came in, if not on the initial talks about implementing the project, but maybe right after. Um, and then some I use a little bit of my background. A lot of you know, I've spent like over a decade in nonprofits, most of it at the Civil Rights Museum. And so that's honestly where I've learned the foundations of my community engagement building and um, project management. But specifically, for the libraries, I'll bring up the Racial Equity um, Institute, the REI classes and the workshops that happen. And then I'll talk about Greensboro Bound Literary Festival Partnership. Um, and so in brief, the REI workshops, again, I'm the previous Dean Martin, to my understanding was talking with the provost who agreed with the initiative based off the campus um, goals and values around EDI, right? To bring this outside um, institute and business in to host workshops, not only for people here on campus, but also opening up to other community members and doing it at a reduced or a subsidized rate um, because the provost and whatever funds here was going to pay for it. And so in my um, starting to work with that initiative, it was really first to kind of flesh out what the goals were. Um, and anytime that for me, you deal with other stakeholders and partnerships, I think it's important to make sure that all of the goals are put on the table and then you find out what goals you have in common, right? You see what the strengths are, you can be realistic. I don't believe in um, overselling <laughs> a project or an initiative just to have partners or um, resources for it. So um, REI in starting that, all right, you already had the campus behind you, you had some resources and so, um, the task was to get these outside individuals, right? People who are not necessarily affiliated with UNCG. One, how do you market to them? Two, how, you know, how does it, how do you work with those entities, companies, and corporations, one, to send their people and, and pay for it? And then um, three, again, how does that overall build into the greater good and trying talking about um, racial equity and EDI initiatives? So for me and, and um, starting to work with that marketing was important. Um, but again, given um, the climate that we're in, um, we, we played with it well, so to speak. You know, everyone is talking about EDI issues, given what's going on, current events, right? This whole cultural shift that is needed, this awakening that's happening. So um, for that project, it was pretty easy to get public interest. And so the hard part came into like, okay, we can only have this certain amount of people. So how do you fairly and justly fill the class to make it you know, worthwhile as far as financial resources, but also be fair. Um, and so yeah, REI is one, I guess I'll get into other examples of how that kind of fanned out. And the other one is Greensboro Bound Literary Festival. Again, those two seem to be the staple or what I see to become very permanent fixtures that I'm gonna work with as far as community engagement for the libraries. And again, the Greensboro Bound Partnership, those discussions were taking place before I got hired. But shortly after when I was hired here for the library, I began to do the same thing, a SWOT analysis and just kind of assess, again, what are the goals, the intentions, the stakeholders. Um, and yeah, so I'll get into it more, but right now REI and then the Greensboro Bound Literary Festival. Okay, I'll go next. Um, so most of my community connections are to some degree connected with um, collection building because of my job. Uh, we do a great deal of community outreach to local community organizations and special collections and archives because one of our curatorial menu areas in the manuscript collection is local history, local and regional history. That being said, while I do work with a lot of specific organizations, 
um, the two projects I will probably draw most from for this uh, presentation will be the uh, Pride of the Community Project, which was the first large scale initiative to try to document history, in, LGBTQ history in the area, as well as our Triad Black Lives Matter protest collection. Um, and those were interesting initiatives because we're not talking about an, organ, an organization, we're talking about a genuine diverse community, um, which constitutes several groups within it. The Pride of the Community was not started <clears throat> because of any specific event, it was just um, part of what I look at when I'm doing community outreach is where do I see uh, our collections lacking, um, both our digital community collections and our manuscripts collections. And LGBTQ history uh, was definitely not a strength for us at the time. So uh, I had done a lot of LGBTQ outreach work on our campus uh, through the Safe Zone program starting in 2008. Mm -hmm. And this was before the Safe Zone program was actually funded in some way by our campus. Originally, it was just grant funded by the Guilford Green Foundation through the Wellness Center. And I was actually an instructor for Safe Zone for a long time. And I was very interested in the LGBTQ history of the campus. And I thought, well, wouldn't it be wonderful to expand this outward into the community? Um, and David Gwynn hunted up a uh, National Endowment of the Humanities Common Heritage grant, uh, which gave us the seed money to start working on that project. The Black Lives Matter protest collection was a bit different. Um, that was started because of the protests that happened this year. And we knew we had to document it um, and we had to make the project happen very rapidly. And working with that project, we worked extensively, we work extensively with uh, Tara Green, who is a professor in the uh, African American Studies and, and Diaspora Studies Department, as well as the Women and Gender Studies Department. Um, she, we've also brought in um, several members of the community who have contributed to the project. David Gwynn is also uh, working on that project as is uh, Rhonda and uh, Aaron. So we have a good team for that project. The, um, I suppose the, the issue that initially arises with projects such as these is we're dealing with marginalized communities, but we're represent and we're representing an organization and a large organization in the area. So we need to gauge levels of trust with communities because we don't know what sort of relationship these people in these communities have had with our organization in the past. Um, interestingly, that has been more of an issue with the Pride of the Community project than it has been with the uh, Triad Black Lives Matter project, um, which I can talk about a bit in a little while. Um, but so far, uh, We've been very pleased with the success in the community outreach and support of both projects. Um, so kind of like Stacy, collection building has been a part of some of the projects, community-based projects that I've worked on. Um, you guys are probably mostly all quite familiar and tired of hearing me talk about well-crafted. Um, so, you know, that is definitely a project that's focused on documenting the beer and brewing history, um, community, the beer history community here in North Carolina. Um, one that you might not know as much about, but that is available for everybody in um, our digital collections is the 27 a collection we have of materials from the 2017 Women's March, where we actually um, basically just put out an an APB uh, on our social media calling for photos from the march. And so, um, you know, we were able to collect about 100 or so photos from folks who um, attended and participated in that march. But, um, you know, collection building isn't always behind what um, these types of projects. In fact, sometimes it's the opposite of collection building that's behind it. And it's, um, sharing our resources and expertise with folks in the community so that they can manage their own collections. Um, as Stacy said, 
you know, rightfully so, there can be issues of trust, there can be issues of who controls the narrative when you hand materials over to any um, institution. And I always think about it that way. It's not like me personally, it's the, it's, it's an institution and an institution that has a long history and a big reach that doesn't involve me personally. But um, we, we've got a number of projects where we've gone out into the community and either kind of served as a consultant when it comes to helping folks manage their own archives or even supervised grad students or others who are working on site at archives um, in the Greensboro area. So two of those that popped to mind are um, a project that started in 2018, early 2018 or late 2017 with Temple Emanuel, which is the um, oldest of the uh, Jewish synagogues in town. But, um, you know, Temple Emanuel very rightly said, you know, we have a great collection, we have a great history, we want it to stay with us and we want it to stay within our control. And uh, so we worked with a grad student, I supervised a grad student who worked on that project and continue to do some work with that now. Another one that's kind of in that same vein is a collaborative project right now that I work on through um, the Institute for Community and Economic Engagement here on campus, IC. Um, they actually have a grant to fund a multi-institutional partnership. So a and is also involved in this. Um, that's a partnership with Beloved Community Center here in Greensboro to um, process their archives, digitize some of their materials and help them build a, an archive on site at their um, organization based on the records that they have, records that they're creating. Um, and so I do a lot of work with them just in terms of talking about, um, you know, questions like, I have these cassette tapes, what do I do with them? Um, and it's not just saying, well, you need to digitize them, but you know, what resources are available? What can they buy within the budget that's available to them to do the work and to get the work done without having to rely on um, an institution uh, that, that they may not have 100% trust in? The third kind of driver for a lot of these projects is outreach and education. So um, it's not getting so much as it's taking things out of the building. And this is something that archivists um, in the past have struggled with. Uh, you know, in the early 1980s, archivists started talking about outreach and the need for outreach and the need to take things out of the building. And so that's actually the motivating factor behind Hop Into History, where we go, or at least, you know, back in the pre-COVID days, we would go to a brewery and set up an exhibit with actual, you know, some reproductions, but as much original material as we could take. And we would just talk to people and tell stories and engage with the folks who were, who happened to be at that brewery that night. And that kind of grew into um, another event that got postponed because of, of COVID, which was Triad History Day. We had a first Triad History Day event um, in partnership with the Greensboro History Museum and uh, brought together about 25 or 30 different cultural heritage organizations from across the region to the Greensboro History Museum on a Saturday afternoon to talk with folks about what we have, what we do, and what stories uh, we can help tell. So those are kind of the three motivators and some ideas on some of the projects um, that, that we've worked on. Awesome. So I guess we'll go in the same order as we did before. Um, how, how did that community connection begin that you each talked about and how did you go about identifying your partners? Um, right, so for me again, first REI workshops um, before me being here, but again, I think the Dean talked with the provost office again, recognizing um, one, what Racial Equity Institute and what they're doing um, can provide a way to also continue the mission that this campus has when it comes to EDI efforts and being a minority serving institution. institution. So that partner um, was kind of already identified for me. But again, going a step after that to make sure we have students <laughs> for the workshop to happen, I began to um, one, identify organizations and companies that were willing to pay for these slots or these positions to have students come to the workshop. 
although the, the, the libraries and UNCG were subsidizing, subsidizing a good portion of the fee, there still was a fee nonetheless. So I wanted to first reach out um, to companies or organizations whom I research that say they have a social responsibility to some of the things that align with what Racial Equity Institute and these workshops were supposed to provide. And so um, I'm reaching out to their diversity chair or reaching out to their HR to say, hey, do you know that UNCG Libraries offers this type of workshop that normally, if you were to bring in someone else, their prices would be very different than what we're offering if you were going to submit, you know, being paid and then making sure that those who signed up actually are there in attendance. So um, again, I identified companies and organizations that say they had this shared mission of social responsibility and talking about how to be culturally tolerant and how to deal um, with uncomfortable situations around race. And so from there, this workshop really sells itself. Again, we're, we're in this whole atmosphere globally of culturally shifting how we have talked about race, right? And, and what we begin to have as real narratives around it. Um, going to Greensboro Literary Festival, again, that organization, Greensboro, bound was already connected before I got here, but many partners had to kind of be involved to grow at least the library's participation in that festival. And so when I start to look for marketing partners, um, people that can help spread the word, right? People that have constituents and emails that we may not have already internally. Um, I looked for partners that could be financial. Um, although resources have been allocated for such authors to come in so we can be a part of that lineup in the programming, um, financial partners to me is always a good thing. Again, my background is nonprofits that have shoestring budgets. So it was a little bit of a difference for me coming here to see, okay, we have something to work with, but we can also be resourceful in having other partners. And so I just look for people who have shared interests, people who can be reciprocal in their partnership. A lot of people will see a good pro project and wanna say, yeah, I'll help you, but they don't really have anything that can contribute that aligns with other goals that you need to um, make it go and grow further. So um, for the Black Lives Matter project, that was interesting. We all had our own contacts um, with organizations and individuals who would have interest in the Black Lives Matter movement or civil rights regionally. So we, um, we began by getting in contact with the organizations and the individuals we knew would be involved. Um, and some of these people were people we might know personally and some of them were organizations I've worked with before. Um, also, probably um, the biggest element was uh, looking at local newspapers and local news broadcasts to get the names of individuals, especially those individuals who were doing artwork on uh, Elm Street and tracking down those individuals on social media to get their contact information. <laughs> um, we found that sometimes uh, if we didn't know, we had pictures from uh, the art on Elm Street, but we didn't know who the artist was, we couldn't find them, we would post them and the artist would find us. <laughs> so that way we could, we could track them down. And what we wanted to work with people, how we wanted to work with people is, we wanted to capture the snapshot of what was happening in Greensboro during these protests because our city, um, the people in our city reacted in a really beautiful way. They took uh, an incident of hate with the George Floyd and from it created this beautiful artwork. Um, and we wanted to make certain we were capturing the artist's intent. We wanted to make certain for protesters that we could have a record of what they were seeing on the ground as things were happening. We wanted to make certain we weren't um, necessarily um, glorifying one side or the other. So we ask about in our oral histories with individual um, you know, police involvement, we wanted to protect the people participating as well. So um, it was a bit of investigation work for us, um, but we all had very productive leads with our own circle of contacts. Um, we were able to expand that circle quite a bit and potentially open up new avenues of, of assisting community organizations um, with just knowing that they need to record their own material, that they need to record their own history. Um, the, tri the Pride of the Community project was a bit different. We partnered with Guilford Green initially, 
Um, and uh, what we found was we did get a lot of good information and material, and we made some connections with Guilford Green. But where things really took off for us was getting in contact with Gary Palmer, who uh, works at Replacements Limited, which is, of course, monumental as an organization in our area. And he knew so many people. Um, and he knew people who were involved with LGBTQ civil rights initiatives more historically. And this impacted how our project looked for a long period of time. Because first of all, we were getting older, an older group in for interviews and collecting with an older population. We were getting leads um, from an older group of people, which was fine. And in, when you're doing oral histories, that's good because you, you are dealing oral histories with people in their 70s and 80s and you don't know what their health situation is. But the detrimental impact is that of that is you're not getting a very diverse crowd. A lot of the material in the collection and a lot of the early contacts we were making were uh, upper class or upper middle class and they were white. We were really struggling to bring in voices of people of color into the community. Um, so uh, I'm wrapping it up. <laughs> so uh, we um, worked in the second half of our project to focus on that. I could have just talked faster. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, one thing that Stacy kind of hinted at that I think is an important thing to think about in terms of starting any kind of community based um, project is that any kind of community focused project actually starts with you being involved in the community. Um, community engagement and community based work isn't someone from the university comes in and fixes things or solves problems or talks to folks, you know, swoops in and saves the day. That's not the motivation or it shouldn't be the motivation or, or what actually happens in the end. Um, so, you know, the, the first step I would say to starting any community engagement um, project is to be involved in the community, learn what is in the community, learn who's already doing work, meet people. Um, and, and, I, and I realize that that's not always an easy thing to do. Um, I fake it really well, but I'm really a massive introvert. Um, I, I, I'm not very good at going out and feeling comfortable talking to folks all the time. Um, but, uh, but I, you know, when I started Hop Into History, the first thing I had to do was go and talk to the man whose brewery we wanted to use as the setting for Hop Into History and talk to him about how he manages um, events, how we could get on the calendar, what we, what we wanted to do, what resources we would need from him. It was literally contacting him and talking to him directly. And that initial contact was made literally in the brewery just one Saturday. Um, and so it's, it's going out and, and with that, you can kind of build the trust so that it grows into something more. And so Hop Into History started as we take cool stuff to the brewery, but the brewery community is a community and um, other folks in the area learned about what we were doing. And we would have brewers or brewery workers from other local breweries show up for Hop Into History to see what we were doing. And that actually was the seed to grow well crafted. And so, you know, that, that one bit of engagement and active involvement in the local community can, can grow and grow and grow and grow. And, you know, with some organizations, you know, one of the tricks is any kind of involvement like that is a, is, includes some sort of financial, it, you know, you have to pay dues to join a group or something like that, which isn't easy, um, you know, I, I have student loans just like everybody else does these days. Um, and so kind of funding that and funding it out of pocket because the university, you typically won't fund those types of things um, can be a challenge, but you can also kind of find ways around and find partners through other venues that can help you uh, work your way and gain trust in other communities. Awesome. So the last prepared question for each of you is, are there particular resources on campus or off campus that you've used to help build your community connection? 
connection. Yeah, um, so for me, I have the advantage of being from Greensboro. <laughs> um, so, and definitely building um, off of the connections I made again through nonprofit work here. Um, on campus, of course, the, um, the ICE, uh, the Community Engagement Department, um, helps really build off of, I've used the um, School of Education, um, helps, and again, with identifying partners, kind of like Aaron said, it's like you have to know the community, right? And, and you have to go in from a standpoint of not only wanting to invite people at the table, but invite people to have input at the table, invite people to dictate what is on the table and hope that what people take away from the table is mutually beneficial, right? Partnership has to be, for me, mutually, has to be reciprocal. Again, a lot of people wanna attach themselves to something that sounds good and will make them look good, but it has to be, it's a relationship from beginning to end, right? Like I don't do any relationship that's one-sided. I'm not gonna participate, I'm not gonna offer it. So that's how I approach my engagement and, and my partnership. So. I look for people who, again, whose goals, either it's on a website, it's through meetings, conversations, or connections that line up with the goals and the intentions I have for a said project. And then I look at whether or not how invested they can be, I need them to be, and then the conversation of what they're willing to be with that partnership. And so for me, I've learned on campus, like for whatever reason, for the library specifically, or either in the avenue that I'm working in, a lot of the things that we're doing, a lot of people don't know about for whatever reason, right? There's a lot going on or you don't know what you don't know until you know, or however that goes. And so for me, I, I try to seek partners again, that aligns with, okay, this is the mission for said project. Well, I think that this will benefit you too, or you have something, you know, that I think you can teach or help grow or add here. And in, in, in this relationship with that being said is what can we do as the libraries in turn for you to again, make sure no one's leeching off each other more than ever. So for me, it, it's a lot of learning. It's a lot of being creative with what's here on campus. And then I do rely on being a native of Greensboro and, and having connects from, you know, uh, high school volunteering internships to actually having some staple jobs here to either ask questions to point me in directions or to ask questions to see if you want to partner with this endeavor. Um, our part, primary partners for most of the projects um, I've been involved with would be our faculty uh, here. And um, not only have our faculty been a tremendous um, asset to us, they've also sent uh, practicum students and internships our way. So we've been able to make real learning connections with, with students uh, and incorporate help get uh, assistance working on these projects and input from a younger generation on these projects um, while providing students with this experience of working on these projects, which is very rewarding. We do make a lot of contacts with local community organizations um, and we do provide services and advice as, as they request any sort of support. Um. To play off of what Nakia said, uh, you know, I think resources do get adjusted um, and expectations get adjusted based on how invested the community group can be itself. Um, you know, it's important with all of these things to remember that at least for all the folks I work with, what the little piece of the puzzle that I'm working on with them in their job. That's not their full-time job. Brewery owners, it's not their job to document their history. As much as I would love it to be that every brewery had an archivist, um, that is never going to happen and they need to make money and I have to adjust my expectations and I have to adjust what I'm telling them and how I'm talking to them in order to, um, to, to meet honestly what they realistically can do. Even the most um, enthusiastic participant in our project uh it's again it's not his job and so it falls by the wayside a lot um when it comes to kind of contact and things like that so kind of that mindset is good but in terms of campus resources i honestly can't speak highly enough of what our campus um university communications and specifically Alyssa Bedrosian, who's the library contact has done in terms of helping promote our projects. Um, Alyssa and then Eden, who's the media relations uh, director over in campus communications have really helped us a lot. And 
those relationships are ones that I built up during the 125th. They needed me and they needed the archives in order to do their work during the 125th. And I wasn't afraid or ashamed to then be like, cool, now that I know you, let me tell you about Well Crafted. Um, and through that, we were, you know, that's how we were able to get a lot of press coverage that we got. It was Alyssa and Eden doing work with their connections in the community to kind of bridge, bridge the gap and, and help us out a lot. Awesome. And that was the last of our prepared questions. Um, so I guess at this point we can open it up to audience Q and A. If anyone has any questions they'd like to ask. And audience members, please feel free to unmute yourselves if you want to ask your question aloud or put it in the chat. Okay, I can start with one then. I'd be happy to start with one. Um, so can any of you talk about what challenges you felt like you faced in starting your community-based projects? Um, I would say in general, <laughs> challenges I have faced, um, especially coming in maybe when initial conversations um, have already taken place. I think it's important to have partnership agreements, or again, I just think it's really important, although as Aaron said, expectations can be modified or changed, but I think it's really good coming in, having an understanding in all spectrums, what is expected, right? What does your input look like? What is your, you know, your intended outcome, um, the flexibility that needs to come in with it. I, I've ran into problems where there was inflexibility, right? Perhaps whomever, somebody oversold <laughs> what end results could look like or, or what, you know, through the process, this is what you can gain. Um, so that can be challenging, right? Not being realistic in the beginning and not having enough room to be flexible. Other challenges I've faced, um, kind of metrics of, of success, right? What I may deem to be successful, another partner may not. So they may not look at their time, their effort, resources, and money. This may not, you know, it, it could have been a failure for them. And it really does um, affect going forth, right? Because I think of projects and relationships and engagement, not as a one-time thing. It's not a one-time date. Again, I want to be in relation with you. Like, I'm a forever <laughs> type of person. So challenges in the beginning, yeah, overselling, um, not being flexible enough. Resources not being allocated, like you, you thought something was gonna cost this much. Well, you know, inflation happens or, or something took place um, and now that, that triples the cost. Um, also, again, having partners that are big names that may look good for you to get your, your initiative out there, but again, they're not really putting anything into it. So you have to be realistic about your needs. Each partnership looks different and can con um, uh, contribute different things to the, the life of your project. But again, for me in the beginning, those partnership agreements or whatever you wanna call them have been quite challenging. Again, when keeping people interested, or partners, well, this is not what I thought, you know, you asked of me or how it was going to be. So those are challenges overall I've seen before. I'll go ahead and pop in then. Um, so I, to, to, to echo what Nakia said, resources and what resources are available what and on both ends of, of the spectrum are important um you know we uh we have faced a lot of challenges and in, in spite of the attention well crafted has gotten it's it's not a well resourced project it's us going to Asheville um or at least, you know, in the olden days, going to Asheville for a week for vacation <laughs> and doing oral history interviews while we're there. Um, that's how that project works because we didn't get funding um, from the library beyond the initial uh, innovation and enrichment grant. And so that limits, you know, what we can do. We have no oral history interviews 
with people in Wilmington because we've not been able to afford to travel to Wilmington or to other places, um, basically anywhere east of Raleigh, um, just because the funding hasn't been there. And we've been asked by multiple people, well, why don't you expand the project to include spirits, whiskey, wine? And it's one of those things where it's we have to realistically tell people, and we've told a lot of people this a lot of different times, we can't expand the project because realistically, it's none of our full-time jobs, period. And so we have to carefully scope what we can do, when we can do it, and what resources we have. Um, and not, resor not what resources we hope to have or what resources we feel we could successfully advocate for, um, but what we literally have committed to us in writing, make people commit in writing, uh, even within the library, um, what resources we have to support um, the work that's being done and, and adjust our expectations, our community members' expectations, everybody's expectations uh, accordingly. Um, make sure we're all on the same, all in the same boat, all on the same page, and um, no one is thinking you're going to get more of anything because, um, you know, we all know what the economic climate looks like right now, but even when the economic climate was better, um, you know, there's no guarantee uh, of what you're going to get. Um, so that's kind of that's the biggest challenge that we've, and, and I mean, and that's the biggest challenge with just about everything in life is resources and money. But, um, you know, I think that's, that's one of those things where all of the dedication and all of the love and all the devotion and all the good feelings and good meanings in the world can't really overcome it because you have a limited number of hours in your day, you have a limited number of resources available to you, and you have to adjust accordingly. Um, Stacy, do you have something before I add another tidbit to that question? I second everything that you have all <laughs> said. Uh, basically, I would say you community outreach and engagement is really um, personally gratifying, but it's something that can burn you out very rapidly. Um, so transparency, as Erin said, of what you can achieve and what your responsibilities are is, is really crucial from the very beginning. Yeah, that was a good segue. Sorry, I'll just end with this. And resources outside of financial, right? Also like people and time. Like what is near and dear to me may not be near and dear <laughs> to who I work for, although they might be on board with the idea or with the partners, you know, resources, people, the time, like Stacy said, the emotions. It is a big challenge that with a partner, you're working with someone there and that person is no longer there for whatever reason. So now it's like, what do I do? You know, you have to acclimate someone else and that person may not work at your pace. And so the challenges is yeah, outside of financial resources, honestly, is that life happens and you have to be flexible enough. And I have learned personally not to take things personal. Um, Cause as Stacy said, like you can get burnt out really fast and these are relationships. And for me, I pour out everything professionally and personally into it because I'm not doing this for the sake of a one-off. I'm doing this for long-term and greater things. So um, yeah, sorry, Richard. <laughs> no, you're doing great. Um, I did, there is a question in the chat from Joe, which is what do y'all bring to the first meeting with potential collaborators? Do you have a template document to help guide the discussion of expectations and hopeful outcomes, for example? Or do you like to prepare, prepare specific information? I'll start off since I didn't start off last time. Um, it depends on the meeting because sometimes you go into meetings and you just know people want to talk to you, but you don't know really what they want to talk to you about, uh, which is always fun. So if you are going in and you have a project, um, first meetings, it, would, it, it really depends. You can bring down a list of resources you have readily available that you need to work out in the first meeting, essentially, the, what would be contributed by you and the other organizations or constituents involved. Um, so I usually don't bring a guide or anything of that nature to a meeting unless I have a very certain, um, if, unless I'm really certain about what is what that meeting is about and um, that we are that far along in, in the process of the pro project. So that would be like if we were undergoing a grant pr 
proposal with the community organization, we would have something written up absolutely. Um, but I've met with um, organizations like the League of Women Voters who they may want assistance in having community assistance and understanding how to organize and what's important in their own collections or they may want to donate, they really don't know yet. So part of the reason I'm there is to for them to come to have the information so they can come to a decision of their own and so that they can be aware that we're willing to assist them, whether they want to retain their records or donate to the collection. And honestly, I go into a lot of meetings where we're kind of being test, I'm being tested. <laughs> um, about uh, not only my organization, but my competence. <laughs> um, I, the League of Women Voters was a fun meeting because there were two librarians on the committee I was meeting with. So they just started doing rapid fire questions about archival practices and how things were organized and archival organization versus cataloging. Um, so that's, that's always fun. Um, so basically how prepared I am in a meeting is going to be reflected in the type of meeting it is, um, my intent going in and how prepared my donors or my community uh, partners would be. Um, do you want to go next, Aaron? or? Okay. Um, for me, yes, I bring, I think it's my personality type. So I bring as much information and specifics that I have. If I have the who, what, when, where, why, what I think a partnership, you know, looks like I do bring all that. Um, I bring honesty. I leave enough room for a small talk. I try to fill the, fill the room, right? But um, I do have a template, glad to show it or share it with whomever. But again, for me, I think it works. I just want to bring everything that I anticipate the partner asking me, because to me, that feels that, that it shows that at least that I'm equipped, <laughs> you know, me, um, sometimes I'm meeting with like big wigs. And so I had to even like, be self confident in myself, like being young in my age, like I do want to kind of this is what we're working with. This is what I have. This is where I see you fitting in, but I leave space like how do you see yourself fitting in. So yeah, I, I have a template and I bring any and everything. And I also bring the, the attitude, um, you know, there's no love loss, you know, if you decide to decline. And I'm, I'm, I'm very open with that. And I hope I don't come off abrasive. But yeah, I bring literally all that I have, um, the respect for their time, the excitement for having them on board, but also the gratitude and the understanding that perhaps this isn't something that at least right now you can get with. So. I tend to go a little bit in between the two of them. Um, I don't have a um, specific template that I use like for every single meeting because, you know, like I said, so many of these things are different. But what I do is at the first meeting, try to get as many stakeholders at the table as possible. I don't want it to just be a, that, you know, and I say this knowing that there's probably already been a small group conversation. This isn't just some grand meeting that happens and I showed up. but. Um, the, the first official meeting of the partnership, I want to have as many stakeholders at the table, just because like Nakia said, you never know who's going to leave, when they're going to leave, who's going to step out, who, ha who knows something from 15 years ago that somebody else right now doesn't know. So, you know, have, to have all those folks there, but also I usually come in with a, um, not necessarily with something as formal as an agenda, but with a list of questions. And I send them the list of questions well in advance of the meeting so that they have an opportunity to think through um, my questions, which inevitably will somewhat probably align with their questions, but also might stem more questions from them. Um, and so that way they kind of get a general sense of um, what I'm thinking about in terms of the, the overall uh, project, the overall angle, um, just based off of those questions. But again, the questions also leave the room for me to uh, learn what they want, what they know, what they've done, um, what they haven't done, and what they haven't thought about, <laughs> um, and, and, and piece all that together so that it really is a, um, a reciprocal project that's, that's kind of built off of that partnership from the beginning. And um, Stacy and Nakia both already answered this in the chat, so I'll point this one to Aaron, which is um, what sort of tech tools do you tend to um, take to 
work with your community partners with or advise with them on. I will just point back to Nikia's response that quote, Google Drive is bay. Um, it is indeed. <laughs> um, Google Drive is very helpful. I'll, I'll be honest, we have found, we tried to do some work and we've tried this with some of the breweries when it comes to transferring records to use Box um, and Dropbox. And Box in particular is not useful when it comes to partnerships with outside folks outside of UNCG and particularly with folks outside of institutions where you have an institutional box account. So yeah, Google Drive is is the go uh, the go to project um, for us because you could honestly you can you have everything in one place. You can use it to track things. You can use it to keep your meeting minutes. Um, you know when you, when you've asked all these questions and and you've got answers written up, you can share a document there that's like. These are the responses that you gave me. I just want to make sure I have everything right, um, which is also super important. But yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, Google Drive is is uh, the 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 helpful resource there. The one thing I will say though is if you get to a point um, where particularly you're doing things like collection building, like we've done, um, also remember that Google Drive isn't a permanent space for things to live. Um, and so you will have to copy out some stuff, migrate out materials for, uh, I say this as the archivist, uh, for, for long-term preservation purposes. Um, Google Drive doesn't do that well. So um, you, you will want to migrate things out um, as needed and depending on what it is. Another question um, from Melody. So there was some talk about this already, but I'd love to hear thoughts on the responsibilities that come with bridging gaps between community and academia. I'll jump on that one uh, first. Uh, so, you know, I think, first of all, I think the library is in an interesting place when it comes to academia because we often tend to be, uh, a group that's not thought of as partners on these types of projects when it comes to specifically with faculty. Um, you know, our, our own colleagues tend to forget that we are uh, academics uh, and, and we are their partners, potential projects on partners on projects that go outside of the library. But, um, you know, I think humility is the main thing that comes with that. Um, I never want to go into a project with any community member calling myself an expert on anything. It's important to always remember that like, I know stuff about archives and archival practice because I've been doing it for a long time, but I have no idea about how things are managed, why they're managed, what's happening at Temple Emanuel or at Beloved Community Center. Um, I'm not an expert on their records. I'm not an expert on their story. I'm not an expert in telling them what they should do and how they should do it. I, I'm bringing the resources that I have at my disposal, both the resources that come with being an academic, but also the resources that come with being an archivist for 20 years. Um, I'm bringing those resources in partnership with them. I'm not telling them um, what to do. And so I think, you know, for me at least, I, I don't come from a culture of academia. I've been working in universities for a long time now, but, you know, I'm from a tiny town in rural South Carolina and neither of my parents have a college degree. So, you know, I, I can come with the humility uh, in some ways that, that come with knowing what happens in the community and how the community is based. And I'm not from Greensboro like Nakia, but I'm sure, and I'm, this is my toss over to you, Nakia. I'm sure that, uh, you know, being from Greensboro also helps a lot with that. Um, yeah, so I will say in my experience, one like being from here, but also I've worked at other nonprofits, like I, I've lived in Madagascar for a little bit, right? So like not like flexing, but so, but yeah, being from the community definitely helps, but um, in my kind of two years of working, going from nonprofit civil rights museum, right? Because coming from a nonprofit, going into a community, one, I do have the advantage I'm native. 
um, depending upon the community, I might reflect that community, right? And then coming from a nonprofit, there's not as much of a gap of intimidation, right? So you say, yeah, I'm from this university, I'm from this. A lot of people, like Aaron said, like my parents too don't have college degrees. So if I were to go to Brown Summit, North Carolina, most of that community, if I'm saying I'm coming from a university, there's already some type of at least subconscious inferiority complex. It, it is what it is. So you bear the responsibility and the burden of one, um, recognizing that, being sensitive to that, and also being honest. Um, again, depending upon the community, there is relationships where things, you know, they're just there for your resources, be it your stories, be it however you can advance, you know, make them look better. So you have a responsibility, I think, first, knowing the community that you're going to go into, right? And you have to be sensitive to uh, the particular feelings they may have about you, and you have to be honest. Um, and I know, you know, you become working or representing the, the university or, you know, the world of academia. But I mean, let's let's not forget, like, I don't know. I'm sorry, I can't put it into words, but I definitely can understand what Aaron said. It's that humility. And I think you, you owe enough to learn about the community first. It's not an excuse that you are not from it. It's not an excuse that you don't reflect it. You have to do your due diligence before you go in there. So you have some type of cultural competency of with whom you're, you're speaking with. Um, again, I agree with everything that Nakia and um, Aaron said, and uh, I worked with, I worked in public libraries before I worked in academic libraries, um, and in public libraries in very rural areas, which um, the first words when I would speak would be, oh, you're not from around here. So I've had some experience in adapting into communities um, previously. What I would like to add is, um, that sometimes you're going to encounter community organizations or individuals in the community who haven't had a good experience. And so what's important to remember is when you are approaching a situation like that, yes, you represent the organization they've had the bad, the bad experience with, but you're in a powerful position of doing reparative work with the community. So you want to prepare yourself to be the sort of person who can do that type of work. And that means pretty much at the beginning of the conversation, listening to the complaints, which is important. So you know where the people have been burnt and what you have to fix and what you have to address. Uh, so the idea of knowing that you're going to have to do some sort of potential reparative work when you're engaged with communities is something you always uh, need to keep in mind because you don't necessarily know where that's going to pop up, if it's going to pop up for an entire organization or just one individual that you're uh, speaking to within that organization. To balance off what Stacy just said, and I think, you know, it can, that, that kind of hurt can pop up in different settings that you don't expect. Um, you know, we, we, I, with, with Well-Crafted, we had a person who had some awesome historical materials related to North Carolina beer history. He had gone to you, he went to UNCG, he was a UNCG graduate, but he was a UNCG graduate who had played, had wrestled on the UNCG wrestling team and UNCG athletics cut the wrestling team and he was mad and he was not very pleased at all um, and and didn't want to participate in the project be because of that so you know it can pop up in different places so you know you just kind of have to be prepared and be willing to kind of roll with it and not again not take it personally it's it's not you um, and you weren't there but that doesn't mean that their argument's not valid All right, folks. Well, I see that we are right at 1.59 p.m. Let's give a, a virtual round of applause for our presenters. Where's my reactions? Where's my reactions? There we go. Look at that. Yay. Thank you all so much. This was really great and I think really informative and a great way to kick off this series. So um, thank you all so much for joining us today. What a crowd.
very exciting. Um, and uh, yep, December 14th is the next one. I will be sending that 15th, that's right. Yeah, I, yes, I was like, wait, no, that's a Monday. I usually don't know what day of the week it is anymore or what the date is. So we'll, fi we'll figure this out together, but I'll send some information about that out later this week. Um, but I do hope that you will all join us then if you can. Um, and for now, have a wonderful day and a great week. And thank you all so much for joining us. Bye. Thank you, Nakia, Richard, uh, Stacy.